Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Watto here with my great friend, Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. And on this short video, Paul, what are we going to be talking about? I guess resistant hypertension. Is this a topic of any use to you in practice? I mean, as you know, it comes up all the time. There's a reason we've done, I think, 35 different episodes about hypertension <laughs> on the podcast it's because it, it comes up a lot. So yeah, this one was hugely useful. Uh, Dr. Cohen, again, knocking it out of the park. Yeah. Also, we're, we're huge hypertension nerds, but I learned a lot of new stuff in this episode. So let's, let's give you a, a little taste of it on this, but we can only give a little taste. So Paul, uh, there's some people have RAS driven like renin, aldosterone, angiotensin, you know, that that's driving their hypertension. Some people have extra sympathetic drive, uh, driving as the, as the cause of their hypertension, but probably everybody has a little bit of both is what Dr. Cohen told us. But she did say that in her practice, she does ask about anxiety. Is that something that you were doing? And did it surprise you, the med she said she has a lot of luck with? I, it surprised me there was a specific med that has been studied that has evidence behind it. And yeah. I, you know, just as a reminder to our to our listeners and, and our, our viewers, I guess, is Dr. Cohen is at a, like a hypertension clinic. So by the time patients get to her, like we, we're probably in the land of resistant hypertension already. Yeah. So she will screen for anxiety or, or look a little bit more closely for it once the medications don't seem to be doing as much as you might expect. And she suggests if you uncover anxiety during that screening, citalopram actually has good evidence and has been very effective at lowering blood pressure in patients who have kind of that sympathetic drive that's driven somewhat by their underlying anxiety. That seems to be the medication that seems to be the most efficacious in terms of lowering blood pressure, which I, I don't know about you. I thought was fascinating. I thought it was very fascinating. Hadn't heard about this. And she did mention like she's a good primary care doctor too. So she's like, of course I build rapport. I don't immediately just suggest that anxiety is causing their blood pressure problem. She does her due diligence. One of those things, Paul, that she says, everyone, we should always check. And we've said on the show many times we should check, but uh, what did she say? We should check on all patients. And is this something that you're now, you know, doing more in your practice? It's, again, because of our, our many episodes in the past, I've been doing it more often, but she suggests checking for hyperaldosteronism, so checking your, your, your renin-aldosterone levels to get a sense. Because for, it's a, it's a good chunk of resistant hypertension, Matt. What is it, like 20, 30%? The number kind yeah. of varies depending Something on who like, you ask, but mm -hmm, it's a 20. good amount. Yeah. And it's, she made the point that I th also thought was interesting that a lot of people say, why check is not going to change my practice, but it turns out in practicality it does. Like once you have the diagnosis, you're much more likely to prescribe what is probably the fourth line agent you should be picking anyway. Um, but having the diagnosis makes you more likely to at least choose something that's going to be a little bit more helpful for the patient. Yeah. So you're looking for that suppressed renin and that elevated aldosterone level. And uh, see prior shows for, of the curbsiders. We have we have a ton about how to how to interpret that and uh, with some great experts. So yeah. So we're gonna all patients. You know, think about anxiety, uh, which is a new thing for me. Citalopram so maybe uh, send the renin aldo and then Paul. There's a, there, she had a specific order for all of this. And so, you know, everybody, almost regardless of, of their etiology for their hypertension, you're going to use those first line agents, calcium channel blockers, ACEs or ARBs, and a diuretic. And then your third line agent, Paul, what, what, or sorry, your, your fourth agent that you're going to add, she mentioned what that would be for her most of the time. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, and I guess sort of more specifically, she mentioned what it wouldn't be. It wouldn't um, be, yes. Okay, yeah. good so, point. No, it's so it's, it's the, the point being, I, th I think a lot of us, well, I won't put this on our, our, gen our gentle viewers, but I would say I, it is not unusual to hear someone reach for a beta blocker once you've kind of run out of options. It feels like it's not going to mess with the electrolytes too much. It's a medication you have comfort in dosing. Um, so I, I, I understand the impulse, certainly, but it turns out that in the absence of a hard indication for a beta blocker, that may even worsen cardiovascular outcomes. So I was surprised to learn that Dr. Cohen might even reach for guanfacine, which I had not thought much about in the past couple of years, or even the clonidine patch before she reached for a beta blocker in the absence of heart indication, because the outcomes seemed to be worse, in addition to them not typically being great antihypertensives. Yeah, I mean, that was very, I knew beta blockers were no longer first line for hypertension. And generally, I'm only using them if someone has another indication, you know, AFib, uh, systolic heart failure. But uh, it was surprising that she also suggested not only are they worse at preventing cardiovascular outcomes, they might in some populations like the HIV population, she said, there's evidence that maybe they even worsen cardiovascular outcomes yeah. for patients who don't have another indication. So really think hard about that. So the so it was the calcium channel blocker, ACE, ARB, diuretic. Those are your first three. Uh, MRAs are typically her fourth go-to agent, uh, you know, if she's going to add a fourth agent, um, just because there's so many people with either suppressed renin or, or hyperaldosteronism that you would be catching with that. 
Um, amiloride is another one she said she might consider if they can't tolerate an MRA for side effects or whatever reason. And then, as you said, the, the guanfacine, the clonidine patches, not the clonidine pills, the patches, uh, which give a steadier level, are, are what she would do. So, so much great stuff on this episode. Uh, definitely click on the link in the transcript to hear the full show because we have a lot more. Like, this is just a taste. Like I said, this, this one is really packed. Um, and with all that, uh, Paul, I will say this has been another episode of The Curbsiders bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. You bet your sweet dippy, Matt. <laughs> all right. Until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And I remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Thank you and goodbye.